I'm Seth Nagelberg. I'm the chair of the ceramics department. Uh, I'm going to introduce Lisa Clegg. Uh, Lisa is an internationally known sculptor. She received her BFA from the Cleveland Institute of Art and her MFA from the California College of Arts and Crafts. She teaches workshops at craft centers and from her home studio uh, in Bakersville, North Carolina near Penland School of Crafts. Her work in clay is otherworldly, dreamlike and surreal. Monkeys, rabbits, and deer interact with the human figure. Uh, Lisa's solo, ex ex solo exhibitions include uh, the Blue Spir Spiral Gar Gallery in Asheville, North Carolina, Unidati Museum of Figurative Art, Blue Sp uh, John Natsoulis Gallery, Robert Kidd Gallery, John Elder Gallery. Her uh, group exhibitions include, this is, this is edited, in fact this only goes back a few years and it's still a mouthful, uh, the Taupe Gallery, uh, Be Alive in Art, Awaken Gallery, The Power of Dreams, Sacramento State University, Concurrent Conventions, A Spectrum of Contemporary Ceramics, Momentum Gallery in Asheville, North Carolina, Sofa, Chicago, uh, Nseek of Mor uh, Morgan Glass Gallery, Deconstructing the Conversation, Bascom Center for the Arts, Forging Figures, the Center of Craft, Creativity, and Design. Uh, and, and with John Natsoulis Gallery, the California Conference for the Advancement of Ceramic Arts. A few more. Uh, Epics, Myths, and Fables at Meyer Gallery. Taboo, Sexuality and Sexual Identity in Ceramics at Signature Gallery. Uh, award, her awards include the North Carolina Arts Prize, the Virginia Groot Foundation Grant in 2000 and 2011. Uh, her, work, her work has been published in Asheville Made, Ceramics and the Human Figure, The Best of 500 Ceramics, Ceramics Monthly, The Figure in Clay, 500 Ceramic Sculptures, Poetic Expressions of Mortality, 500 Animals, and 500 Figures. 500 Accomplishments. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Um, Lisa's work is in museums at the, the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, Oakland Museum, uh, Oakland, California, the Fuller Museum, uh, and Lisa wanted me to tell you that she has a new book coming out uh, from John Atsoulis Gallery, and it's coming later this year. Please welcome Lisa Click. Hey. Well, <laughs> coming back to the Institute, it's a totally different place than when I was here in school. Um, so I'm going to just talk about my whole journey in clay and it begins with that my parents, if most of you may know, are both artists. My father was a metal sculptor, John Clegg, and my mother is a potter and works in clay as well. And they are both alumni of the Institute and my dad taught here in the 60s, 70s in the sculpture department. So growing up, uh, I had my parents as artists and I was always making things and um, my sister was a little bit more practical. She's a black sheep in our family. She became a nurse. Um, so she had a little more sense than us. But um, I gotta regroup here. So um, dad, these are his pieces. And then there's mom in the studio and so I was always working in different materials anyway um, I knew I never wanted to work in metal or clay because I didn't want to do what my parents did so I eventually went into illustration and started at Columbus College of Art and Design where I did illustration and advertising for a few years and eventually I realized that that wasn't going to be for me so I decided to transfer up to the Cleveland Institute of Art in 1983 and I wanted to take painting. I took painting, jewelry, textiles, and eventually one semester, uh, the only elective that was available was clay. And I thought, oh, I don't really want to take clay. But I did. And Judith Solomon, that's another of my mother's work. Judith Solomon and Bill Briard were teaching here. And uh, this is the only picture I have of my pots so I began clay learning to throw on the wheel. 
and eventually I, I made three boxes and I sculpted cicadas and frogs and different insects in the boxes and that's pretty much what turned me on to clay. I realized it could be more sculptural. So this was my space is in the uh, corner up in the studio where it is now and I was working from nature, uh, a lot of uh, organic pods and and uh, cactus and different things and it was working quite large because we had those large kilns up there and eventually this is the hallway I moved into um, uh, my boyfriend at the time it was hit in a car by a car he was on his bike and he was in a coma the whole last year that I was in doing my undergrad work and Viola, or, um, Judith said, well, you really should do a piece about the experience you were having. So uh, every day I would have to go see Mark in the hospital and I finally built these two boxes. They were constructed out of wood with a steel base and then clay slabs that were pushed through fencing wire. And they, they ended up being like Iron Maidens. Two boxes, sorry. So they were two boxes. In one box, there was a figure that I had made hanging inside, which talked about him being entrapped in this coma. And then the other one was an open box, which was sort of the unknown of not knowing what was gonna happen to him. So I worked the whole last semester uh, on this piece. And it was the first piece I ever did with metal and clay, combining the two. And it also was the first piece that was about my life, about what was going on personally. So it was significant for me for those two reasons. And I eventually got the um, Agnes Gunn Traveling Scholarship, and I was very interested in Eastern philosophy at the time. So I got out of school. Um, Jerry Aidlin got me a job at the Natural History Museum casting Dunkey Elastis bones. So I did that for a few years until Mark passed. And then I finally went to Japan. And I, before I went to Japan, I knew I wanted to go to grad school. I applied to Alfred, didn't get in, and then I thought I would go to Cranbrook and study with June Kanenko, and he was retiring. So I thought, oh, I, I'd like to go out to California and see what was going on with the funk music movement, and decided to go study with Viola Fry. So I had a layover coming back from Japan, and I went out to San Francisco area and met Viola, and talked and got into the graduate program and then flew back home, packed everything up and moved out to California. And Viola was very eccentric. Um, you would, her warehouse was just overwhelming. You'd walk in and there's just huge sculptures and platters and paintings and cast ceramic trinkets and and her work ethic was just phenomenal. In fact, she would often, if you were taking a break in the studio, maybe having a cigarette or something, she'd walk by and she'd say, you know, that's 10 minutes out of your studio time. So she was always calculating and watching us and, and telling us how much time we're missing by doing other things that weren't as important. But she was an inspiration, uh, just with the energy and her, her, her drive for work. This is my early work in grad school, so I continued after the metal and clay piece here, investigating the combination of the two. And it was funny at the time, this was 1989, 90, uh, there was no figurative work being done at CCAC at the time. And she, Viola was always like, oh, the figure is dead, despite the fact that she did the figure. So we all were working abstractly. I experimented a lot with rebar. This is uh, my graduate show. So they were just, again, still abstract forms. And slowly, eventually, a head got stuck on some of the pieces because they started to feel figurative to me. And I got out of graduate school. And I moved into a studio in Benicia, California. And it was a 5,000 square foot warehouse. 
And Kathy Erdeman, who's a potter, some of you may know her work, uh, she moved to New York and handed the studio down to me to take over. And a great thing about this studio was the kilns were hooked up to a meter in the space and I could take the meter and turn it upside down and run the power backwards. So I would run all my firings. For, so for all those years that I had this studio, I didn't have to pay for my firings, but it was just kind of neat to be handed that secret down from her. So I got out of school and the one thing that Viola said is she said, you know, you should work for a few years just on your work. Don't worry about showing. Just try to find out what it is you want to say with your work. And this is a quote from John Cage, which I love because it says, when you start working, everyone is in your studio, the past, your friends, your enemies, the art world, all the above, your own ideas. But as you continue, they start to leave one by one and you're completely alone. And then if you're lucky, even you will leave. And that was her idea of just working and not listening to her critiques and her voices or whomever's in your head and just figure the work out. So I filled that studio up several times, just continuing, trying to figure out what I wanted to say with the work. Uh, I started the figure after and self-taught myself. So the initial figures were, they were a little bit too intense when I just used the human form uh, because they were evoking dreams and nightmares and whatever was going on in my life. And at that point I realized that I would use the animal head as opposed to the human face. Inspiration, uh, Hieronymus Bosch, obviously, you can see his flavor in my work. Um, I remember being about 10 years old, pulling a, Bo a Hieronymus Bosch book off the shelf and opening it up and seeing uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights and just being blown away and realizing that as far as the imagination, you could pretty much let anything fly. And then Carl Jung, his philosophy of the collective uh, consciousness and interpretations of dreams, he is always, his writings have always been an inspiration. So I said, with these dreams that I had, I finally decided to make a sketch from each dream when I'd wake up in the morning. So I did a whole series of these small pieces and eventually I really realized that the human form and this idea of the subconscious and all these layers could be really a lot of fun to work with. And so that's pretty much what started me off on all these double-headed mask pieces. That's just a shot in the studio in Benicia. And the early works, you can see they were masked, the human figure with the animal masks. And highly glazed, a lot of color, and slowly over time, I wanted to get them to be more surreal and more dreamlike. So I slowly started to get rid of the color and they became much more simple in the surfaces. But today in the studio, I was dipping metal and fabrics. These were the early pieces that were dipped in plaster before I discovered the slip. And that, the bra there and the metal, that's all plaster. So I would weld, I'd build the whole figure and then weld the metal onto the figure and then paint and drip the plaster, which actually gave a nice effect because it would rust through the plaster. So that's just the rust coming through. But eventually I realized one day that metal got into the slip and it stuck to the metal and I thought, oh wow, wonder if that would actually fire and stay on. So from that point on, these all that uh, wire work, metal work, that's clay on the, the metal. So this body of work, you know, I showed, I showed in Scottsdale, Arizona and around the Bay Area and I taught around the Bay Area at Susan College and different places. But I finally, after those two years of just really working on the studio, when I finally got the work to this point where it felt dreamlike, and I was really happy with it, I ended up getting a, my first show in New York with that body of work. So this, that's dichotomous dream and intellect and spirit. And this 
The double head pieces started sort of from that, the Jungian philosophy of the animus and the anime and the male and the female energy in all of us. So one head might uh, be the more feminine sheep where the other head is the male energy of the goat. And I had fun with finding horns and using some found objects. And my two scales that I like to work on is this life size and then the doll, smaller pieces. And uh, then I became pregnant with my daughter. So umbilical cords started to come into the work. I made myself as the Madonna, kind of a mother figure in the middle. And then the two heads on either side is my daughter, the two, the monkey and the bird. So my work is pretty much about everyday life, and that's a detail. The big one. And drawings, I always draw along the way. And, let's see. So um, Izzy was in, my daughter was in ballet, and so she'd come around with tutus on, and so I started using tutus. And then eventually, at one point, I, these are some small pieces, double trouble on the one side and then trick. And this is when I started dipping the fabric in slip so you can see the wrinkles of the skirts on these. And I used real doll eyes and taxidermy eyes behind the masks. That's Hieronymus and another detail. So they were, they were playful and yet whimsical but had an edge to them and I really like teetering on that where you're drawn into the piece but you're also repelled a little bit so they're a little scary but not not too much uh, so then eventually in 2001 we moved left california we were living up in calistoga uh, in the napa valley and just the whole bay area has gotten expensive and busy so we just decided to leave and we put our house on the market and in three days we've got this offer and we ended up selling things and packing three cats and a baby and packed up a u-haul and headed towards colorado ended up way in estes park and then finally uh, regrouped and i had taught at penland school of crafts in the smoky mountains so eventually we started to look at property there and we ended up moving to bakersville and this piece, um, Bakersville, and uh, the area I live in is wonderful because Penland is there, so there's a lot of artists, but there's also, it's also Appalachian, very Baptist. And I remember before I built my studio, I was working in a, a building behind, we have a lot of outbuildings, and I was working on this piece for the Robert Kidd Gallery. And prior to arriving to that area, there I had heard that a building was burnt down at Penland School of Craft that was that housed Norm Schulman's work and other artists. And some kids, young teenagers, came by and looked inside, and they thought it was pagan work in there, and they burned it down. So I had that in the back of my head. And uh, as I was working, uh, we have a church down on the corner and the pastor, Steve, came by to visit. And he said, oh, you're an artist. You'll have to bring my wife sometime to come and see your work. And I know he was thinking I was a potter or something. And I was thinking in my head, oh, don't, don't come. Don't, don't come and see the work. So of course he came, knocked on the door and came in with his wife and here's this female figure with a negligee dipped in slip and a goat and horns and all this other work and I thought oh my gosh he's gonna think I'm a Satan worshiper and so I just started talking and saying the work is all about the subconscious and all the layers of personality and the masks we put on for different situations and I thought and they didn't say a word they pretty much just said okay okay and left and I thought I remember calling my dad saying oh my goodness I'm gonna be you know they're gonna think I'm this crazy person doing goat heads and eventually he came back and he said you know Lisa I understand your work people come to church and they put on a nice mask for you know to be a good Christian and then they go out and drink white lightning or whatever and so we ended up creating a relationship and it was fine but it's an odd place to be living because of the the very simple Baptist Appalachian background for a lot of the locals they wouldn't understand this work so then I carried on with Izzy, my daughter, who was, I was always playing with toys and, and 
things with her, so I found some old cars. And I have old celluloid Japanese toys that you wind up, the whirly gigs. And so that was an inspiration for this piece, this body of work. And so this is monkey on my back. And I welded the metal, and then I had a friend, John Getchy, blow the glass spheres for it. And this is another from that. Those are croquet balls. And, and this is when my daughter was running around with Stuart Little slippers on. I was talking about this in the studio today. And I thought I wanted to find something, I wanted to sculpt something that was childlike and naive looking to go to be in combination with the figure. But I knew if I tried to sculpt it, it would just be contrived. So I saw her Stuart Little slippers, and she had sock monkeys and stuffed animals, and I thought, oh, what if I just dip those so stuffed animals? So those are actually Stuart Little slippers that I put on the feet of the piece when it was wet, and then the tutus dipped in slip. And then this whole period started with stuffed animals. These are the two more of that era. Those are my blocks from when I was a child on the left. And this was the beginning. Those are the sock monkeys dipped in slip. So I would sculpt the whole monkey in the figure and it would be all finished. And then I would dip these wet sock monkeys and position them, place them on the shoulders. And then of course you have to coat it with enough slip and I re-sculpt the face because you lose all the details. And then that monkey burns away and you're left with the shell. That's small ones. So these are the stuffed animals. That one is my old blocks and that's pretty much Izzy is the monkey and she's got me on the horse so she's got me by her arms and the one this one I did just graphite drawing. Sometimes the ceramic process gets so tedious so I just did graphite drawings on tissue paper and then decoupage them onto the monkeys. You can see a detail. And at that point, I started drawing with just graphite pencil onto the clay. So that's what the graphite drawing looking parts are. And I made, found a rivet gun and started making tin hats. And so this period was pretty playful. And of course, I had to shake them up a little bit, give them little features that aren't as cute and playful. So that's my pornographic little grouping over there. But I would dip them and they'd be wet and then I'd stick them all together and these ended up being big wall pieces. And then I combined that one as a stuffed animal head cut off, dipped, sculpted in addition with my, my sculpted head. And the one on the right, you can see that's a bustier dipped in slip. So someone was talking about wire and are you able to dip or put fabric over wire. You can see the metal inside that fabric that comes through when it's dipped. And this is Temptation. And these are all you know, life-size large pieces. And I have to make them where the parts come apart so that tree branch is welded and comes out for shipping and that sort of thing. And this was my first show in Asheville. And there was so much discussion about this piece. And it was at the Blue Spiral Gallery, which was pretty much craft, you know, traditional crafts. And I was one of the, you know, 15, well, probably 18 years ago, where they started to show figure and that was a little bit more challenging like this piece and I heard all kinds of things like oh she must be really she must keep her her therapist employed and <laughs> she must be really sick and all this and so it was interesting and now it, things have changed there of course and these are silk flowers dipped in slip so I've dipped all kinds of things in slip and again the double head I'm, it's really hard to do a figure without two heads because the way that they interact and I can have one feeling a little bit more introspective and the other one is a little bit more, you know, looking out more dreamlike and more uh, tangible. And again, being autobiographical with my work, at this time my father was suffering from lung cancer. 
So I would just draw along on the back of the piece and that would start to talk about what I was going through at the time. And it also made me want to start to bring in the human face a lot more in my work. So you'll see I started working on that more. And then the white work after he passed, um, it just didn't seem like the white clay was getting the feeling that I you know, was feeling after he passed. So I started this series of these dark pieces and that is just graphite powder rubbed onto the surface, which makes it really look like iron and it takes on the, the texture of the clay underneath. So there's a crackly glaze on the forehead and then it's just raw bisque clay and the tin hat. And I just spray on an adhesive and then burnish in this, this graphite. And they, it was great because people were like, oh, I didn't know you were working in iron now. And I was like, oh yeah, it's really great. But it's a beautiful surface. And these, this series was, again, from his lung cancer. The back shape is a lung shape, although it could be a butterfly or something else. I don't feel like you need to know the story behind the pieces, but that's where they came from. So I did a series. I made a mold of that back shape and then just added the figure and just did all kinds of variety of things with that shape. In a detail. And then I took that back shape off and just used the figure and, and the small figure and elongated it. And so that's a group of wall pieces from that series. And then I was inter invited to a teapot and cup show. And I made one teapot and it was a figure where the arm was a spout and that sort of thing. And, but the cups really caught me, they really intrigued me. The heads come off for the cup, and of course, as a studio artist, I always have to find a way to support myself, see, because I rely on the sales of my work. So these cups have been really helpful over the years, because there's people that collect cups, and they're actually a lot of fun to make, and I get a lot of ideas for other pieces just through these, these small, you know, they're only maybe 12 inches at the most. And I use them for glaze testing. So these were testing different surfaces and glazes. And a detail. And those, you can tell those are real doll eyes in these. And recently I've uh, started using cotton balls dipped in slip, which make these great kind of cloud-like forms. So this, this was probably two years ago, those cups. And then someone said, well, do you ever make, you know, I could just afford a head. And I was like, oh, okay. So I started doing a whole series of just small heads. And they, again, were fun. You know, they're, they're simple and easy, not labor intensive, and I just play with them. There's a cicada on the head and a Mickey Mouse, and they're just fun. And then somebody said, well, what's the largest head you've ever made? And I said, well, life size. So then I did a whole series of very large heads. And this is the one today in the studio, if you were there, that I said I blew out the whole side and was able to repair it with the fiber and refire it and it survived. And then over the years, I've taught all these workshops where I take all my classes to thrift stores to find metal wire you know, baskets and fabrics and stuffed animals. And I would always see those ugly figurines in every thrift shop. So I thought, I wonder if I could cut the head of a Beanie Baby off and put it over the porcelain figurine and fire it, and would it work? Would they stay together? Well, it, it worked. So these are stuffed animal heads that then I sculpt the faces, and I would just tie a rubber band around the actual head of the figurine and then dip the whole thing in the end in slip so it all became cohesive and then they're fired to these are just 04 and it was nice because sometimes you could see the decal of the porcelain and the colors of the porcelain coming through so this was a real fun whimsical series I spent days 
walking out of thrift shops with Beanie Babies and figurines, and I thought, oh, I bet they think my house is just filled with level, lovely Beanie Babies and figurines. <laughs> And you have to make them a little bit odd, too, or else they're just cute. And I incorporated the wire and the dipping with them as well. So then I go back to a series of heads. I love the interaction of all uh, heads together. So this is, a, this is about a six-foot piece. And just playing with a different emotion with the different animals. And then back to finding a buggy with wheels. I'm still, I always go back, in fact, recently I've I'm gone back to finding wheels to, to use in the work. So this is a quite a big piece because of that, that's a life-size buggy. And there's a detail. And those, those eyes are sculpted, but I just love the variation of surfaces. That's a crawly glaze on the one side, graphite drawing. Uh, plaster gauze bandage dipped in slip on the last head. Um, I use encaustic wax at the end, post-fired. I found years ago that glaze has a very cold feeling and that the wax is very warm and flesh-like and it just gives it a really nice sexy feeling. So there's always encaustic wax. Wherever you see the sheen, that's that. And that, I was dipping fabric in the studio. That's just a scarf that gave all that whole texture. So you can see that the, whatever fabric you use gives you that texture. And spirit guide, back to more double heads. This is a few years back in Asheville at the Blue Spiral Gallery, playing with double eyes, you know, any kind of surreal dreamlike feeling and then I went out to Agnesa Udinati's studio in, in Phoenix and I've showed with her for years and worked in her studio so I did a series of, of heads and graphite pieces and then showed in her museum there and it goes back to the dream the nightmare the shadow all that Jungian philosophy and then at one point I was it was kind of a midlife crisis where I just, actually the work was really awful. I was doing the uh, too many bells and whistles, dipping fabric, the metal, real eyes, and it was all just getting blurred into way too much. So I decided I would just put all my work to sleep because you know for years with all these eyes, they've been looking at me and watching me. So I shut all their eyes, put them to sleep on pillows. And then I just stopped for a while and just drew. So that's this series of my everything being asleep. Those are concrete pillows cast. And when I came out of that stage, I finally realized that I, my work had been about having a baby, being in school, being pregnant, being married, having Izzy, watching her grow up. And somebody in a lecture once said, well, what are you gonna talk about in your work after your daughter's grown? And I was like, I, I don't know, you know? So I ended up making myself into a queen. I was like, well, I'll just become a queen. And this piece, of, the first queens happened out at Anderson Ranch and the crown just came because we were at a thrift shop and there was some cheap little wire crown. And I thought, well, that's fun. So that. You know, thinking of what I, how, what I want to say about the work and then also it just happening and falling into place. So again, instead of the mask, the animal being the mask, now the animal is kind of the spirit guide, the wise character who, who is my guardian or helper or guide, I would say. So this was, I would say, 2015 or so that this whole series started. And today I was talking about the fabric dipped in slip for the hair. These were the early ones where that was just solid clay and very heavy and I was amazed it didn't blow up. And now I've realized I build a slab form, a clay form, and then the fabric goes on top so the whole piece can be much lighter. And another thing that's happened over the 
years, which I have had a lot of fun with, is a piece will come back. I often have, I'll have a body of work and there's always one piece that doesn't move, so it comes back. And I'm redoing pieces when they come back. So actually, this is this piece. That's the same figure, but I added the monkeys. And it's kind of neat to have a piece come back and get a second chance with it. And I feel it's always better when I get to add those monkeys and you'll see another piece. And see the cracking on the figure? That's that two clays I was talking about today on the surface, that the groggy clay underneath, the smooth clay shrinks more on top. So that's how I get that detail of the cracking. And that's on most pieces and usually you can't see them unless you see them in person to see that crack. And, but this one, you can get the idea of that surface. And locust stream, that's uh, the cicadas that come out every year and I've collected for since I was a kid and I made the wings out of mica because we have a lot of mica in our area. And another. Beauty is only skin deep. And then this is just, I, I love studio shots. I love seeing people's studios. And this is what my studio usually looks like. I often work on three or four large pieces at a time, plus small work. And that way, my energy, I can just work over here and, and keep the work moving that I don't get too tight and stagnant with it. And also, it, it gets me in there every day because if I feel like welding, I weld. Or if I feel like working with the figurines or fabric, so I always have something that I'm excited to work on, and that's helped me as a studio artist to get into that studio every single day. And some small, these are back to the wall pieces. Androgynous Dream, that's one of my favorites. Just, I, I like the pieces when they, they really feel that dream way. You know, they're surreal, they're odd, it's male, female. And then this piece I redid, this went to a show and came back. Um, I'll show you that image a little bit later. This, I, um, that's just the clay that I wedged metal shavings into, um, bronze shavings, and then the metal melted through the clay. So that's not a glaze, that's actually the metal coming through. And I blow balloons up. I've uh, been concerned with the bees disappearing. So I would blow balloons up and put it in the fabric and the dipped fabric and cloth to make those caverns. This one, this was a learning process. That bottom form, those are cotton balls dipped in slip. And when I first started this whole dipping deal with these pieces. Um, I didn't make a slab form. I just stacked the cotton balls up. And so when I fired it, there was no structure and the whole piece, this piece just all fell. So, and broke all the hands off. And I was like, ugh. And I, I really can't afford to lose pieces. So I just broke off the whole bottom part. And then mixing that nylon fiber I was telling you about into the clay, I could reattach a form to it, redo all those cotton balls on the bottom, and then redid the hands and the piece was saved. So I don't lose anything mo anymore, which is a relief. And then I've been teaching in San Miguel de Allende for several years and got re-inspired by masks. So then I've started doing just some really large scale masks. And this is a few. And again, these kind of pieces are exercises and they allow me to explore. So I started going to comb six with the work recently. So the cracks are getting bigger and the metal and the clay are melting together a lot more. And they're really giving me some rich surfaces that I'm excited about. This one, I was talking about how I dip the fabric or the paper towel and keep building out, kind of like you dribble sand on the beach, building those things. You know, that building these hair pieces out was just building that, you know, uh, paper towel dipped in slip. And then I welded the metal right onto the clay. And more recent, that was Anderson Ranch two years ago. 
And then details, uh, I'm all about details and surfaces. So this is a uh, wax and then a drawing, graphite drawing on the tissue paper that I did years ago and then burnished into the wax. And it's amazing, it just, it doesn't even rub off after that. So I do a lot of burnishing of the graphite drawings into the wax on the surface of the clay. And here you can see the nails that I talked about pushing in. And that's ball clay just rubbed into the surface of the clay that gives the cracking all around. So I'm all about all those details. Here's the one, the, the big beehive piece that I blew the balloons up in to get those caverns. And then I discovered resin. Oh, I just in love with resin right now. So I cast the bees in resin. And then I also paint and drip resin onto the clay because I don't use shiny glazes. This is all post-fired surfaces. And this was one of my large figures at Sofa Chicago. And I love the gal who bought it because she was a redhead and, and seemed to be a good companion to my redheaded figure. And the monkeys keep coming back. So this is just a series of wall pieces where I made the abstract kind of round form that all these monkeys sit in on and on, on the wall. And that's some aluminum metal and luster in the graphite pencil on clay. And a few more in the studio. So they're just fun for me. And then I wanted to surface because I was really concerned about the environment and wanted something to feel very earth-like. So I wedged, you know, I thought, you know, in the desert, you see sea pods, they crack open the earth when the pod comes out. So I wedged pinto beans and lima beans into the clay. And what was great is, which I didn't realize it would happen, because I work on the piece over a long period of time that it's covered in plastic, it just allowed all the beans to sprout. So there were these roots coming out and brand, you know, plants, and it was fabulous. But then, so what it did is it popped open that surface to give that cracking. And they, of course, all burned away, and that is the texture that I got from it. So this is fairly recent. This is probably last year. And this piece, again, went to a show. And then she came back, and I thought she needs, again, another companion. So I made the monkey after, and now she's this. And now she go went off to another show. So this is the extinct prince came back to console her. So that's... You know, my concern all about the animals, monkeys, wonderful monkeys that are becoming extinct and bees and all kinds of things. And a few more. And Spiritus. And this, I was just really angry. <laughs> she's just, she was mad. She's really mad about what's going on in the world. So she's just like, mm. and, uh, Shades of Gray, I think, is the title of this one. This was last year at Sofa Chicago. The back detail, that's the graphite drawing on the, the wax. And this one is the one upstairs in the studio. This one has metal rods that come out of the head, and those were put in when the clay was wet, and then that's all just fabrics and all different kinds of things attached and the crown is metal and clay. And this is another one that's in my living room. And this is Willow, these are recent as well. And, you know, self-teaching myself the figure over the years, I feel like finally, how many years later, I can finally do a face with ease and joy and pleasure. And it's not, it was always such hard work for me. You know, it's like I, I, when I started, one eye was lower or, you know, one eye was, you know, closer or farther. And I finally, I think I've got it. So it takes time. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of sculptures to finally get to the place where I can sculpt a face with ease. So this is, um, this one's coming for the show. This is the bee, uh, those are again, cast resin wings and those, Components all come apart for shipping. And a studio shot of her in progress. 
This one, Rabbit Dream, that's that figure that came back again. Then I added the tree and the two rabbits. So this, this ended up being a favorite piece. And Fox Hunter, just talking about the, I grew up in Gates Mills, Ohio with all the hunting dogs and, and actually it's just about you know, animals, they don't have any, they can't protect themselves and the things we do to them. So that's the story behind this one. And details. And then this is that piece in progress. Now, I just love clay. We all love clay when it's wet. I just think it's so beautiful there. And then you fire it and you just have to try to bring it back to life. And that's one of my paintings in the background. And another recent three headed piece. Uh, I found that this actually is a candelabra that I altered. And again, the wheels on the bottom. And then this is a detail of a piece in the studio. And the, a lot of times that my drawings and painting feed into the sculpture because I do draw on the, the sculptures and leave the lines as I work. And then this little tree piece is made out of wire and clay. And it really echoes what happens in the painting. So I'll go over and paint, and then I'll, I'll see that white line. I'll like, oh, that, that could work in clay. So I really go back and forth between the 2D and 3D. So these are four by four foot paintings. And they're house paint. I take my torch, I burn them, I grind them. They're on wood. There's wax. There's, I just use whatever's around. And this one, I often will put a clay piece is on the painting, so the little kind of chandelier shape and that piece at the top are clay. And about the honeybees again, this is a six foot painting. And then I draw. These are just blocks of drawings. These are all on wood, just a house paint and graphite drawing. You can see the illustrative background coming in a little. And I, someday I would love to make these pieces, but there's just not enough time. And that's an old leather seat, so sometimes I just find things to paint on. And then recently, again, I need to uh, have income coming in, so I started doing these. I call these my mini-me's, and they're only maybe two or three inches. And often in the wintertime when my studio is expensive to heat, I'll just walk, catch up with Netflix movies and make little little pieces. And they're, they're fun exercises, and I just sell them online, and it helps me monetarily continue what I'm doing. And then those pieces ended up added on to paintings. And small heads again on pillows. And these are just some small, maybe six inch, eight inch wall pieces. And then cups. I realized ah, I could draw. I'm always looking for something, to, different surface to draw on. So this is just under glaze black pencil on uh, bisqueware that I buy. <laughs> so I did a whole series for a long few years of these drawn cups and then now I've had the drawings made into decals and I make decal cups that that I can move easily and t-shirts. <laughs> and then I design my own paddles. These are curved paddles um, that are just make it so easy to make the figure. You just can paddle that round curve and get a symmetrical head or arm or thigh very easily. So I have four sizes and those I sell on my store site. And occasionally I go back to platters. Viola always did platters. I, another way to play with surfaces and experiment with, uh, there's inlaid color clay there, there's metal, slips, clay, all kinds of playing around. And then I started recently making some large pot forms and they were so fun because they weren't the figure. It was just very satisfying just to make a big, large, wonderful form. And then those I'm using to paint on or glaze, under glaze on. So those are sitting there waiting to be finished and someday I'll get back to them. But that was a nice break from the figure. And then I, these are my workshop students and those, those are their pieces. So when they come to the studio, they, they do brilliant work. <laughs> A recent shot, this is what's going on in the studio 
fairly recent. A few more. I almost drive myself mad with so many pieces going, but it just keeps this energy going that I, I just love. And it takes me maybe six months or more to get through a whole body of work. This is, all of this is almost done for, and it'll be going to Sofa. Those are the silk flowers dipped in slip on the one figure. And my ducks, they come in and visit. <laughs> so I have all kinds of animal characters around me all the time. And one day the calf decided to come in. He got out of the field and <laughs> before I know it, he's coming in the studio. So I thought, wow, what a great sculpture. It's perfect. So good. And there they are, my characters. I live in the mountains, of course, near Penland, in the, in the middle of nowhere. That's my, I hike this regularly. And my grandbaby. So that's, and then I entertain, and this is my family and friends. <laughs> and that's it.